All right, it was fun. All right. So here's the funeral funeral policy. I, I do think let, let's not rush past the cover. All right. First of all, we probably, I don't know, do we reference anywhere that this is a copyrighted image? Oh, good. We at least mention that the artist in the very back, this should be a booklet, but we had trouble printing. So um, uh, this, of course, is from the Narthex. Um, this is the uh, artwork by Ed Riojas. I believe that this rather ugly version of it is one that I took with a, with a film camera back uh, in the dark ages before digital photography. Um, and we uh, set up the painting outdoors in the courtyard to try to, uh, uh, so, I don't know, we need to pay him and get the really, the, the nice image and have that on here. Anyway, um, uh, that painting is just incredibly uh, hopeful and strong. I love that that's where we put the casket or uh, when we have an urn of ashes, that's where we put uh, the body before the funeral. Right, so um, I know uh, we've got a lot more room in the fellowship hall for visitation and stuff like that, but we, I think it's really nice that we have the body of our loved one uh, right there by the resurrected Jesus with his arms reached out in blessing to that one and to us as we mourn. Um, I, I think it's stunningly beautiful what we have here in our Savior. Um, and uh, I would note in that painting, if you've ever looked carefully, you do see Mount Calvary in the background with the three crosses. It's, uh, oh, it's right over there by Jesus' left foot. Um, you can kind of barely see it in this uh, version. And then a little farther over uh, toward the right um, is uh, the open tomb. Uh, and then you have this uh, kind of sarcophagus uh, that Jesus has ridden, risen from with the uh, words carved in it. And, you know, Ed, because he's such a realistic artist, actually made a sarcophagus and carved into it these, and then painted, the, you know, a, a painting of the carving that he did in stone. Now I'm making that up. But um, uh, this is uh, from Revelation 1. Um, I am he that liveth, uh, let's see, I am, how's it go? Um, let's see. Um, he, I was dead and behold, let's see. It's about his victory over death. Let me get it right. It's Revelation chapter one. Only you got King James there, right, Ed? Is that right? Um, do you know, Ed? Oh yeah, here it is. I am, let's see. Um, I am uh, the, uh, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forever. Um, yeah, and then he says next, I have the keys to death and hell. So he can open the way out of hell and out of death, right? He's the one who's alive, who died, and is alive forevermore. This is really important that he's not just the one who's alive, but he's the one who is alive, who died, and it's good that he's not just dead, right? That he is the one alive forevermore. That is our only comfort in the face of death. Um, and for those of you in early service, I had uh, something struck me during the distribution of the sacrament that I probably should have said at the sermon at early service. Um, those of you who are going to late service, cover your ears right now. So, um, uh, just kidding. Um, uh, so Luther does get really bold and strong and angry, okay? There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think the reason he gets so bold and strong and angry is precisely because he knows how important it is to have a comfort that's real and solid, that's not based in him, that's based in the Lord. And when you try to get in the way of the Lord delivering that real comfort um, uh, to real sinners, Luther gets furious, right? And that's why he had the guts to stand up. Uh, because he was, he knew his need for the gospel that caused him to be a, such a strong voice for the gospel for you and me and for all, and why he wouldn't let a little bit of good works creep in as being the way that we're saved, but that it's all Christ, right? So that, that's what drives his big fight, that it is the true body and blood of Jesus and the Lord's Supper, 
that uh, the word of God actually delivers what it says, the full forgiveness of our sins and salvation and so forth, right? So that's, um, it's precisely that love for burdened souls, his own included, that caused Luther to be such a vibrant voice for the gospel. All right. Um, so uh, first, uh, first Thessalonians, easy for me to say, First Thessalonians 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Um, uh, the Thessalonians, uh, some of them, were caught by an idea that those, only those who were alive when Jesus returned made it into eternal life. Can you imagine how sad funerals would be if that's what we believed, right? That, oh, that guy didn't make it either, right? Oh, no, right? Um, and uh, so the Thessalonians, I mean, how sad. This, this guy died before Jesus returned. It's over for him. Too bad he couldn't hang on. Um, uh, I mean, it's a crazy idea. I don't know where they got it from, but Paul corrects it. And thanks be to God, not one day in your life did you believe such a silly idea. Thanks be to God and to St. Paul's, the Holy Spirit's work through St. Paul. You know that... Uh, those who die, die in the Lord. They're at peace. They're doing great right now, you know. Um, and we're going to join them in the resurrection to come. And maybe we're here when our Lord returns, which would be just fine with me if Jesus returned right now. How about you? I, you know, I, especially Michigan fans want you to like to just get out of here. Right <laughs> so, um, what, you know, let's just, you know, why couldn't Jesus have returned before the end of the game or something? Um, uh, or all the other heartbreaking things that go on in our life. When, you know, so uh, we pray, uh, what, that, that, so, Jesus died and rose again, and even so will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So when Jesus returns, the dead in Christ, the souls are already with Christ, their bodies will rise from the dead, their body and soul will be joined together, and they will be first, and then they'll come to get us, and then we'll be caught up together with them, which is the word rapture. Um, the rapture is this crazy idea, uh, not the biblical idea of rapture is that we'll be caught up with uh, Jesus and all these when they come on the last day. The evangelical or, excuse me, millennialist idea of the rapture is that, um, <coughs> that Jesus will kind of secretly grab all the Christians out of the earth. And uh, my sister had a sticker in her car um, when she became a born-again Christian um, at, in, what, 1973, I think it was, and she had a little sticker she put on the passenger side of the car, warning, in case of rapture, the driver's seat will be vacant. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, yeah, so I was always ready to grab the wheel. She had a, <laughs> she had a pretty nice car, so I, you know, I'm like, okay, well, that's all right. I'll take the car. I'll figure out, and I'm ready to put it in the park. If I have so, um, uh, uh, no, no, it's not going to be like that. It's not like the Christians are going to be out of here and then all the rest of us are stuck or something. Um, the unbelievers are stuck in a world without any confession of the gospel. Um, or any Christians. No, no, no. When Jesus returns, Jesus is clear about this. Could be like lightning, light at the whole sky. Everybody's going to know. Nobody's going to miss it. And if you're at a cemetery, it's going to be a blast. All those vault lids, <laughs> right? And all the, all the people popping out, all geeked to get their bodies made whole and strong. And those of us with glasses on at that point will go, man, these are making my eyes. And they, oh, I can see great better without them. Right? It'll be a wonderful, wonderful time. Right? And what joy for the believers in our Lord. That's what Paul's talking about. And then uh, Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We have the King James Version there of Psalm 23, which has brought tons of comfort to us. 
And I'd argue we're always walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Right? Because we're all mourning somebody. Um, and we always are. And we're all dying. It's a slow motion dying that we're going through. Um, we're all headed that way. Um, so we're always in the valley of the shadow of death. Thanks be to God, he's always with us here. It just becomes a little more obvious when you're really up against it. Like Pastor Cheryl famously talked about in his sermon when, about his heart attack, when all of a sudden you're having a heart attack and this is a real heart attack and you know, then you're like, you know, what do I believe? Who do I trust? And our Lord's right there with us. And my experience is that faith is actually, there's a real battle on the deathbed when it's a lengthy death. But when you're really right there, there's, the Holy Spirit provides us with amazing strength and comfort in what Christ has done for us, right? Like, uh, abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. Uh, uh, oh Lord, in life and death, abide with me. Something like that, roughly. Um, by the way, I noticed this morning, it looked kind of like my brain outside. Um, as we're headed over here to Bible, so that foggy thing. All right. So here, uh, here we get the uh, the policy part of the policy, uh, the purpose of this policy. Life is a gift of God. Uh, you didn't cause your life. Purely given to you by God wasn't your idea. Don't you remember? You didn't even want to be born. You had to be pulled or forced out of the womb. Right. This is all God doing it, not you. Mankind brought death into our world through sin, but the Lord did not abandon us. He sent his son to suffer, die, and rise again to forgive our sins, to break death's power over us, and to restore us to himself. Those declared holy before God by faith in Christ Jesus, like the uh, epistle today said, right? We're justified, we're declared righteous, not guilty before God, by faith in Christ. And only by that faith in Christ are we declared not guilty. Um, so we're declared holy. Those declared holy before God by faith in Christ Jesus are always under the Lord's watchful care, even in death. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now that's kind of fun. We got small caps that somehow got elevated. That's a kick. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, your death, the day you die, is precious to the Lord. I mean, from our point of view, honestly, I've been at a lot of deathbeds. Death's ugly. You know, the, the skin turns an unnatural color. I remember Agatha touching a Jim's hand and saying, oh, it's so cold, right? It, it's not nice. It's real. And by the way, that's why I think you shouldn't shield yourself from it. I think you should, you should face it head on, right? You should get in there and touch the deceased body um, and be there if, as much as you possibly can. Although if you're not able to be there, and that happens all the time too, the Lord is there. But it, it's a real thing that's kind of ugly, but to our Lord, the death of the saint, it's precious. He, he does not want to look anywhere else. He doesn't want to look away because he, he cares for you. He looked away when Jesus was dying because he was me. But when you're dying, that's Jesus. So he can't take his eye off you. And think from his side. Ah, you know, this poor saint has been going through such troubling things. And... Oh my goodness, that poor, this poor saint who keeps repenting has been tripped up by the same stupid sin how many times? And I have to keep forgiving him. <laughs> and now, now this dear, dear one gets free. And I get them with me forever. The way I wanted them to be. The way I designed them to be. You know, death really for the Christian is victory. Not that you all ought to go run off and kill yourself, mind you, that's wrong. Or that you ought to go, oh, please let me die. No, I think 
Lord, come get us. That's great. Let's go. Although there is that point in life where it's okay to say like we do every Sunday, Lord, except this Sunday, thanks, Luther, uh, where we say, Lord, now let your servant depart, die in peace. Right? I'm ready, Lord, whenever you want to take me. You put me here. You take me when you want me. And that moment when he takes us is precious to him. It, he would not be anywhere else. The Christian church has always seen the funeral service as an opportunity to praise the Lord for Jesus' saving work, which has conquered death, not just for himself, but for all who die in him. Uh, this is the first time we brought the word funeral into this policy, and I do think it's important that you know here at Our Savior, our our motto is, we put the fun in funeral. So, just so you know. Um, I, now, I do say, I've been to funerals other places. I, we do put the fun in funeral here. Um, and by which, and I mean the true eternal joy. We take seriously death. We mourn it. We weep about it. We're not, I loved what, my daughter-in-law said after uh, a Jared Byers' funeral, oh, I've never seen a pastor vulnerable at a funeral before. What a beautiful thing. We're mourning, and he is too. Um, I dare say we haven't had a funeral here where you couldn't see that the pastor too is vulnerable, that he's mourning with us. We're, we're not, you know, we don't, this isn't just some celebration of life. This is, indeed, we celebrate the life that God gave us in that person, but be warned, we hate death. It's gross, it's ugly, it's stupid. And it's our own fault by our own sin. If, there, if, if our first parents, thanks Adam, hadn't sinned, right, we wouldn't have death. Um, but he did it, and you know, if we had been there, we would have done worse. It would have gone faster with us, right? The moment God said, don't eat from that, we'd be grabbing right away. We wouldn't even need Satan to come along and tempt us, right? Not the way we are. Um, and th that we can be honest about that. The death is awful, that we lament together with Psalm 130 as we come in, you know, out of the depths have I cried you, O Lord. Not, oh, happy day, right? But out of the depths we cry to you. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. If God didn't forgive and we're up against death, we'll forget it. It's, we're just toast. But if God is a forgiving, gracious, merciful God, oh, then we can face death. And, and fear God, uh, recognize he's the judge that's going to judge us, and we fear him then by believing his word, repenting of our sins as he gives us opportunity, trusting his word of forgiveness, and his word that you who walk in him and follow him have the light of life, and you will never, never walk in darkness. It's not going to happen. He's not going to abandon you to death and the grave. He will bring your soul to him immediately, and he'll bring your body along later. In our society today, many, many funerals focus only on the person who has died rather than the Lord. And by the way, that's the most depressing thing you could possibly have. Because let's say the person's a really, really good person, you know, like me. So, so you, you, you know, you go, oh, he was the best, he was wonderful, what a great guy, oh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, and then so, but he's dead. So, now, of course, you wouldn't say this about me. So, let's say it's Joe. Oh, how awful that would be. And, and, and then all that good is gone now. And you have no, nothing positive. Um, that's why we don't spend our time talking about the deceased as the only person in the room. We do talk about the deceased. I, I, it's not like we're just, that that person is unimportant. That person's a dear soul. 
but what matters is the one who defeated death for that dear soul, right? That's where we've got to have our focus. So we believe that the funeral liturgy, and liturgy is just a word for um, that what we do together in receiving our Lord's gifts and sharing them with one another, we believe that the funeral liturgy is a service which above all celebrates Christ's victory over death given to our departed brothers and sisters, and we could say to us, through this funeral liturgy, the Lord serves us with the only lasting comfort there can be, his eternal word of life, which also offers us something more powerful and reliable than death. Um, Oh, it's Brahms, right? In his German Requiem, I, for, I always forget which movement it is in his German Requiem. Anybody know? It's the one with the dirge at the beginning. Is it the third or the fifth? Anyway, you all ought to go listen to it. Even if you don't like classical music, you ought to listen to Brahms, the German Requiem, and it's either the third or fifth movement. You'll know it pretty quickly if you look at a translation. It starts with, all flesh is grass, and all of its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. And it just kept saying this, keeps saying this over and over and over and over again. And it, and, and it says it in this dirge-like thing that keeps building in seriousness. I remember the couple sitting next to me when the Grand Rapids Symphony did this, um, they were about my age, and this was about 10 years ago, and uh, maybe or so, and, uh, you know, so they're old, right? And, um, and they're all over each other. I mean, it was really embarrassing. You're at the symphony, come on, right? You know, come on, you know, get a room, whatever. But they're, but they're kind of, they got, you know, they're all handsy with each other. They obviously must, you know, they must have been divorced and they're dating or whatever. They, anyway, I don't know. Um, Joe and I were very pious, like we always are at this <laughs> and, uh, um, and they just, oh my goodness. And then that piece started with that dirge. That, um, and I, I don't even try. Uh, anybody know it by heart? Can mom hum it for us a little bit? No? Okay. Well, anyway, uh, it's, oh my goodness. I should play it for you now. Um, and and it gets this serious thing, and then the choir comes in, bold, male voices, all flesh is grass, and all um, its power is like the, uh, the power, of the, let's see, or, and it's, how's it? All flesh is grass, and all its glory is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, right? And then every now and then, Brahms brings the women in, right, to sing that, oh! They're flowers. They're flowers. They're happy flowers. They're happy flowers. And you're kind of like, oh, oh, a little relief. Uh, and, and, and then the grass withers. And the, women, the flower fades, right? And you're like, oh. And this couple, they kind of bring their hands back to each other. They sit up straight, right? They put their hands on their laps. And they, oh, right? Because what's building there, the reality, this big thing of death is coming for us, guys, for every one of us. Oh. If I seem a little more heartbroken this morning, on Wednesday, the 17-year-old daughter of a docs grad uh, committed suicide. They live in Canada. Her name's Naomi. Her dad... Michael Keith is his last name. Michael Keith and his wife, Christine. They have two other children. Can you imagine the heartbreak for them today? Um, and uh, their daughter is a believer. They're confident she's in Christ. Um, I am absolutely with them in that. But it's still heartbreaking. Um, I, and, you know, being 17 is so hard. Don't, if you're ever a 17-year-old, which most of you aren't going to be, but and, you're, and it's ever rough, please talk to us. We don't want you to be alone. We love you, okay? Um, I mean, but, but death's common. So the grass withers, the flower fades, and then, and then Brahms, 
Oh, and our former neighbor over there said, Brown's kind of overdoes it at this point. I don't know. Then the men, right? Or is it the whole choir? Do you remember? The Abba, right? Is it all of you? And then, um, so the grass withers, the flower fades, it just keeps building, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, everything just stops and the choir goes, Aber! Which, of course, auf Deutsch means, but! <laughs> but! Ah, but what? But the word of the Lord endures forever. Who is the word of the Lord? That's Jesus. And the word he gives us is the word of the Lord. And that word is not going to fail us. It's going to look like it's failing. It's going to look like it's not getting us through, but it's getting us through. And that's the point here. That we have something more powerful and more reliable than death. The word of our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ and his promises to us that death can't touch. And friends, this is exactly what we got to rely on on our deathbed and at the deathbeds of our loved ones and in our mourning that the word promises of our Jesus will never let us down, ever. Right? No matter how we feel, no matter how many are around or not around, um, even during COVID, right, people had to die alone a lot. Um, ah, the word of the Lord didn't fail them. He carries them along. So the following then reflects what has always been the policy of our Savior Lutheran Church in regards to funerals. We are deeply grateful to the Reverend Dr. Harold Sinkpile for writing most of this policy under the title, Through the Shadowlands, a Christian Handbook on Death and Life, which was dedicated in memoriam, Harold Edward Sinkpile. Uh, that was his uh, dear father, Hal's. Uh, Dr. Sinkbile Hal, as we call him, um, is uh, my predecessor at Doxology, the executive director for spiritual care. He wrote this before Doxology existed, um, when he was pastor at Elm Grove Lutheran Church, conveniently located in Elm Grove, Wisconsin. So, um, all right, understanding death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. These familiar words of Psalm 23 chart the direction for a Christian family facing the reality of death. Here God identifies our greatest enemy in such times, fear. Because of our fallen nature, fear is a natural response to death. Since none of us among the living has ever tasted death, we respond to the prospect of death, whether our own or that of someone we love, with fear. Joanna, the three and three month old or so, three and a half old uh, year old, uh, asked me, we're, what, I can't remember how we got into this conversation. Somehow we were talking about something and, and I said, uh, I think she asked about heaven maybe. And I said, I am so looking forward to seeing my mom and dad. I miss them a lot. And, uh, and I know she mourns her grandmother who died, uh, Bev Nettleman, um, you know, perhaps the second nicest grandmother on the planet. Um, uh, uh, just a dear, dear woman. Um, and you know, both Joe and I got to be with her on her deathbed, which is uh, just pretty remarkable. What a gift. Um, you know, Joanna asked her, you know, um, you know, are you dying? You know, and, uh, you know, why? Because she asked why to everything, right? Why, 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 why? Um, and, and I think Bev's answer was something like, you, you know better, something like, because Jesus is coming to take me home. Um, so I said, well, I look forward to seeing my mom and dad. And she goes, uh, um, well, how will that happen? And I said, well, when I die, my soul will go to be with Jesus and I'll, see those souls are with him and then the day will come when jesus returns i'll get my body back and my eyes and and then you know and we'll all be together joanna all of us who trust in jesus forever it'll be great you know and you won't skin your knees anymore and you won't you know do bad things we always will obey our father and mother then 
you know, and mom and dad will always be good to us. Um, and, uh, and she asks, are you afraid of dying? Um, and I thought, well, I'm a Lutheran, so I'm going to tell the truth. <laughs> but yeah, a little. I'm, I'm not afraid of the other side. I know what's coming. But death itself, I don't know what that's going to be like. I've never died before. I, well, I did die in baptism and rose, but I don't, I don't know what this is going to be like exactly. Um, I know that Jesus says, I'm not going to see death, I'm going to see him. So, um, but yeah, I'm a little afraid of death. And, and God, that's why God gives me promises to tell me he's going to be with me so I don't have to fear. Um, I think it was comforting to her because she said she was afraid too. Um, and I remember going through a thing when my grandpa died of laying awake in the middle of the night, being afraid of death and going, oh my, I'm going to have to face the judgment of God. And I'm, I'm a bad kid. I disobey my parents and my teachers and all that. I tell you, Romans 8 brought me such comfort then. Still is great. So nice to have Romans 8 as the verse today, right? Um, uh, that God does work everything together for our good as we love and trust in him, that he's not going to let anything separate us from his love, that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Um, so, yeah, fear's the real thing. So, now, if fear is the enemy, who is our ally? The psalmist continues, for thou art with me. Thy rod and staff, they come for me. Jesus, our good shepherd, the one who laid down his life for his sheep, is our companion on the dark, winding road that leads to the valley of the shadow of death. The journey is not optional. Sooner or later, each of us, no matter how old or young, will walk that path until Jesus comes again, when, at the last trumpet, the faithful will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Right on that resurrection day. But here's the important part. I walk through the valley. The one who is with us in that journey, who leads us on, bears the scars of death in his living body. He was dead, but now he lives forevermore. All who believe and are baptized will be saved. They have a share in his victory over death. Christians, therefore, see death not as an unfortunate reality to be in, in, endured, but as a defeated enemy. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting are the sure and certain realities promised to all who remain faithful unto death. Faith and confidence are what we need in the face of death. Faith in the Good Shepherd and confidence in these unseen realities the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Sometimes death comes suddenly, at other times it comes slowly after prolonged illness. In both cases, the ministry of God's word and sacrament is our only lasting comfort, source of comfort. The Christian family will want to call soon and often for pastoral care. The pastor's visits bring not only human consolation and comfort, but the sure presence of Christ through his word and uniquely and especially in his supper. With his body and blood, Jesus has removed the sting of death and shares with us his never-ending life in the very midst of our dying. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, I told Pastor Swim I doubted we'd get through the whole thing. I'd prove myself wrong. I'm right, I mean, um, as always. Um, so uh, how about we close with prayer, if that's all right. Lord Jesus Christ, captain of our salvation, you tell us fear not. You say, follow me. You give us the promise that uh, wherever you are, there your servant will be, and that you've prepared a place for us, and you will come and take us to be with you. Oh, Lord Jesus, give us always your Holy Spirit, that we may rest in you and always be ready in you for your summons, and allow us 
to joyfully, faithfully, and with a great gusto, confess your saving work to our dying friends and neighbors and world, that they too may find in you the captain of their salvation, who will never fail them. All this we pray, Lord Jesus, as you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Amen.